So thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and thank you indeed to Coloplast for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today about something uh, a little bit different. So really focusing on the gut microbiome and how it affects your brain and potentially uh, your behavior. So just to give you some idea of where we're coming from, so we're from APC Microbiome Ireland, which is a, a research center headquartered at University College Cork in the southernmost part of Ireland, where we're focused on looking at the microbiome across a whole plethora uh, of diverse areas, not just uh, mental health, but also inflammation, colorectal cancer, and looking at the microbiome across the extremes of life. This idea of a brain-gut axis and how our brains can affect our guts or how anxiety can affect our GI tracts is not something particularly new. This has been something that has been known for some time, and there was some work uh, conducted by a physiologist, William uh, Beaumont. So in, in the next few months, I'll be moving to a department of physiology, so this is uh, somewhat relevant. But again, in keeping with this idea that the gut-brain axis isn't a particularly new concept, there's a language around the gut-brain axis which we use day to day, the idea of trust your gut or something is gut-wrenching, or something is turning your stomach. And this has come now uh, to the fore, both in the scientific literature and in the lay literature. And we can see that through publications in the New York Times, through publications like The Economist, and then scientific journals like Nature, uh, and we have here the human uh, microbiome uh, noted as well. So if we look at it from a very simplistic point of view, and we try to look at this brain-gut microbiome axis, what we would suppose in a, in, the, in a simplistic state is that in a healthy status, where an individual has healthy central nervous system function, that this at least occurs at the same time as normal gut physiology, where there's a normal gut microbiome, whatever that might be at a particular stage in life. Inflammatory mediators are relatively normal. There's no particular abnormality in the immune cells uh, that have come into the GI tract. In the stressed or disease state, and like I say, the work I'll talk about is focused on the central nervous system. So here, talking about disorders where there's a change in behavior, a change in cognition, learning and memory, I'll talk a little bit about that. Emotion are the way in which we uh, sense pain is associated with abnormal gut function. So these patients who I spoke about with irritable bowel syndrome have depression and anxiety. They also have diarrhea and constipation. They have an altered microbiome. Is there a link uh, between these changes? They also have increased infiltrate of immune cells. And so one of the hypotheses underlying uh, a lot of the uh, disorders associated with an altered microbiome is that there is a breakdown in the gut barrier. So the gut is lined by these epithelial cells which protect our underlying immune system from the contents of the GI tract. You can alter signaling between the gut and the brain via this nerve, the vagus nerve, and I'll show you some studies later uh, where we were able to demonstrate that the beneficial effects of a probiotic were lost when we severed uh, the vagus nerve. And we can get an impact on this endocrine pathway which is very relevant in stress which relates to cortisol. So when we're stressed, it's normal that our cortisol levels would increase, but what's equally normal is that after the stressful insult, they would decrease again. So we take a number of approaches in the lab, and, and I know this is a very clinical audience, and a lot of what I'll talk about at the beginning are animal studies that we have done, sometimes in normal animals, and sometimes in animals who replicate disease contexts. And I'll talk a lot about uh, mouse models of autism that we use in the lab. We can also take an antibiotic dissection approach, and we do this largely in our animal studies. So we can use antibiotics to disrupt the microbiome. So expose animals to a short burst of antibiotic therapy or chronic antibiotic, antibiotic therapy to disrupt the microbiome and see what effect that might have on brain uh, and behavior. I've already alluded to some of our fecal transplantation studies. So fecal transplantation is, is really considered a cure now in the context of C. difficile infection, which is uh, um, resistant to antibiotic therapy. And this is where you replace somebody's microbiome with a fecal transplant from another individual. And then we use germ-free studies. And these are mice who are, grow up in a bubble, essentially. So they've never seen a microbe, they've never seen a virus. They, they have no uh, microbial makeup at all, but we use them as a tool to try and better understand how the microbiome might affect 
the way we behave and the way we function. They're a good tool, but they're also somewhat abnormal because they have never uh, uh, grown up with a microbe. And so you can see here these amazing stories where you, have, you, you might have heard of other stories like the boy in the bubble. It's a very artificial environment, but yet we can use it as a tool to inform uh, a little bit what we, what we need to in terms of understanding the gut microbiome. So what I'll start with is talking about, uh, we'll come back to the germ-free animals, but to talk about this concept of early life stress and how that might impact us in the future. And again, we use a rodent model uh, in the lab to, to mimic this early life stress. And so this was work that was carried out by my colleague Siobhan O'Mahony some time ago when the technologies we had for looking at the microbiome weren't as co uh, complex as they are now. But what we did find was that this idea that early life stress changes behavior, immunity, and microbiota, and this could have implications for psychi uh, psychiatry and also irritable bowel syndrome. We also used another approach in terms of early life stress, and I've talked about this antibiotic approach that we can take. And these are animals who we gave a very short burst of antibiotic treatment to using vancomycin during the early life period, and then let the adults, uh, animals grow up into adulthood to see what effect a very short disruption of the gut microbiome at a critical period would have long term. And this is important that there are these critical periods and we often hear about the first 1,000 days of life, but this is a critical window where you can uh, affect the gut microbiome, and that might have long-term health implications. And again, we can use our germ-free, or our uh, mice in a bubble model, to see what effect the gut microbiome has on this visceral pain or this sensation to pain. And here we were able to show, perhaps as, as the last study uh, indicated, where there's a change in the microbiome, we might see a change in pain. But the germ-free animals, displayed pain behavior sooner uh, than the animals who had a normal microbiome are germ-free animals who we introduced uh, bacteria into. So if you don't have a microbiome, you sense pain uh, sooner than an animal who does. So this concept, one of the, the measures that we looked at in these studies is this idea of sociability. And sociability can be very relevant in the context of autism spectrum disorders, where we have deficits in sociability and we have a number of other behavioral changes. And I'll talk about a number of studies where we focused on models, if you like, of autism, which we've termed the unsocial gut. So we know that, that autism spectrum disorders in the clinical population are very much associated with GI or gastrointestinal disturbances. So a lot of patients with autism spectrum disorders will experience uh, uh, constipation, for example. When we look at the microbiome in these animals, it's also very different. So now we're going to have two things happening in parallel. We have changes in the brain, or at least changes in behavior, and when we look in the guts, we see the gut microbiome is different in these animals. So this is a measure of diversity, and you can see in each case the orange bars are significantly different from the control bars. And if we look more broadly at diversity, you can see that the microbiome of these uh, autistic-like mice is very separate and very distinct from the normal mouse. So changes in the brain, changes in the gut microbiome, is there any way that these two things uh, could be connected to each other? When we look at the neurons that are in our gut, so our gut is often called the second brain, there are more neurons in our gastrointestinal tract than there are in our spinal cord. And this is called the enteric nervous system, and it's hugely relevant for our gut function. And when we look in these autistic mice, we find that there are many fewer neurons in this second brain. So there are less neurons in our gut, and the ones that are there are slightly different in terms of the neurotransmitters that they contain. And so maybe these changes underlie the changes in uh, physiology that we see. How might the microbiome impact this. So what we're trying to build upon or trying to do is identify some connectivity between the brain, the gut, and the microbiome. One of the key hormones that regulates our gut transit is serotonin, which is a hormone. 95% of serotonin is generated in our guts from our endocrine cells, and it's hugely relevant in G uh, peristalsis in the GI tract. The other thing that changed in the uh, gastrointestinal tract of these animals were these bile acids. So bile acids, when they arrive in our gut, get converted by our gut bacteria. And we can see that these uh, BTBR mice have very significant differences in what we call primary and secondary bile acids. 
So to show that maybe it's not all bad and to come back to this idea of leaky gut. So we've now seen that leaky gut is implicated at least in our animal model of uh, autism spectrum disorders. It's also present in other disorders, as I've alluded to. This was a study we conducted in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And we identified a particular bacteria was present in these patients with these inflamed guts. They had a clostridium perpharyngeans, uh, one particular bacteria that produced a, uh, a factor that was able to break down the gut barrier. When we did an experiment in the lab with the same bacteria, we found that these bacteria were able to make the uh, gut leaky. So in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, the disease was associated with a particular bacteria. That bacteria was able to produce a factor that's able to break down the gut barrier. And so that might contribute to the inflammation in inflammatory bowel disease. So what I want to, to as we're drawing to a close, is to start to think about mechanism a little bit. So I'm talking about bacteria, I'm talking about probiotics and prebiotics, and a large part of the work that's been done in this area is associative. So it says, well, we see this happening in the microbiome and it's associated with a change. What we want to better understand within our group is how these bacteria are having their beneficial or detrimental effects. Another way of looking at uh, mechanism is this concept of uh, microbial endocrinology, which was coined by Mark Light. So Bacteria produce lots of things that our own bodies produce. They produce neurotransmitters and they're able to produce hor um, hormone-like substances. But generally, th these are bugs that can produce factors that are quite similar to, our to ourselves. One bug that we've identified in our own group is one that's able to produce uh, a neurotransmitter called GABA, or gamma aminobutyric acid. And GABA is a really important neurotransmitter. It's, it's important in anxiety, it's important in pain sensation, it's been implicated in uh, uh, cellular proliferation. Okay, so our bodies make um, uh, this neurotransmitter, but equally so do bacteria. And the bacteria have the machinery to, to make the neurotransmitter. So our colleagues uh, in Cork were able to identify, they screened about 100 different bacteria for their ability to produce this neurotransmitter, and they identified six uh, bacteria that produced lots of this GABA. And so we tested that uh, in the lab. So when we grew the bacteria, we found that as the numbers of bacteria increased, the amount of this uh, neurotransmitter also uh, increased. So we tested the uh, bacteria to see if they were able to influence this secretion in the gut. And we did this in a, a, a mouse uh, colon. So what we were able to do is stimulate fluid secretion using a drug called bethanicol. So here you can see fluid secretion is switched on. And when we pretreat the tissues with GABA, it has an inhibitory effect, suggesting that GABA is anti-secretory. So if somebody had diarrhea and you gave them GABA, maybe that could be uh, of benefit. This might also have implications in the context of cellular proliferation, which is important in cancer, for example. And we know that GABA is important in lots of different cancers uh, throughout the body, but in particular, if we look at colon cancer or intestinal cancer, we see changes in GABA receptors, in the amounts of GABA, uh, and the pathways responsible for the, the synthesis and breakdown of GABA. So GABA has been implicated in uh, colon cancer. So we should really capitalize on the gut. So the gut is a real repository of beneficial microbes and beneficial factors. So we can drive the, the, the activity of our microbes by changing our diet. So I gave an example of one uh, way we can do that is to increase our, our fiber intake, which will re result in more uh, short-chain fatty acid production, uh, which can be beneficial. But you can see there are many other uh, metabolites which can be produced by the bacteria on our, in our gut, which can be affected by our diet. So this brings me to the close, which is where, what, what is the future for all of this? Uh, and my colleagues, John uh, Krein, uh, Ted Dynan, and Catherine Stanton have coined this phrase, psychobiotics. So fecal microbial transplantation is taking a whole uh, population of microbes, but can we take a more targeted approach uh, where we use or define a psychobiotic as a live organism that when ingested in adequate amounts produces a he health benefit in individuals suffering from psychiatric illness. So that's where I'm uh, going to draw it to a close, hopefully on a, on a positive note that I think the feed, we we're beginning to better understand how the microbiome influences the brain and that hopefully now we'll start to see more translation and more mechanistic studies uh, into that. So like I said, thank you very much uh, for your attention uh, this afternoon. Thank <laughs> you.